So, so we have talked about uh, digital image processing the majority of the time in, in this class. Of course, we talked about going from the analog domain to the digital domain when we talked about sampling and in the last, uh, the previous lecture about generalized form of sampling and sensing. So today I would like to show you, to show to you how to use all these uh, theoretical and computational tools to revisit the imaging, pro the imaging processing. So the imaging process, we, we basically, when I showed you compressed sensing, we, it was already clear that we need to build different hardware to implement these ideas. So today I would like to show you a hint of a huge and very fast, very fast developing field that is called computational imaging or computational photography. Uh, so just as a reminder, more or less all the hardware designs that we have seen until now look like this. We have, uh, we have some physical world that reflects light because light is what we are, uh, what we are chasing for. It goes through some optics. I'm drawing here a single lens. Of course, it can be a system of lenses. Typically, it is a system of lenses. It also can be moving because we would like to focus this system on different depths. Then we have a sensor, which is not exactly just a piece of silicon. It has some optics called wafer level optics, including micro lenses that increase the amount of light that a single pixel can, uh, can actually accumulate. They also have uh, and uh, what is called the color filter array or Bayer mosaic that that gives uh, different spectral response to each of the pixels. Then we have some some electronics that amplify uh, uh, the signal, digitize it, and eventually what we already see here is a human intelligible digital image. It might be it might be bad. It might suffer from noise, different non uniformities of the sensor because we have amplifiers for rows or columns of the, of the sensor. They might have slightly different gains because of the manufacturing uh, variabilities. We, the color balance can be completely off. So we, what we are doing here, we are running some digital processing algorithms here in, in this piece that is called image signal processing pipeline. That is a, typically a companion chip that sits beside our sensor chip in, in every camera and it corrects that image digitally. Okay, and basically from here we see uh, what, the t what the phone displays on the screen, for example. And I think I already hinted to you in the very beginning, uh, in the opening of this, of this course, that from the, from the optical perspective, this design goes back probably at least to the, to the uh, medieval times, if not, if, if not before that. This, is, this mimics the eye. This mimics the, uh, how basically our first optical systems looked like. And can we do better? Can we do better? But by, by the way, the, the fact that it mimics the eye, the evolution created three types of eyes, and two, two particularly important types of eyes are the mammal eyes that we have ourselves, which, are, um, which look, li look like this. this. These are the photosensitive receptors in the retina. Light comes from here. And all the wirings are in front. And this is, a, this is a terrible design, if you think of it. And this is how we designed our silicon sensors as well. We, had, we manufactured them with silicon, and then all the connectors, all the, wire, all the metal wires, went on top. Of course, this reduces the amount of light that the pixel can, can collect. We can partially compensate this uh, by, uh, by using uh, these wafer-level optics. But what cephaloids developed, squids and uh, sepia and, and uh, basically different creatures of that kind, they, they developed what is called a backward illuminated sensor. So basically all their wirings of the retina are, are behind. Okay? So basically we, today, we, today the best sensors are backward illuminated. We, we manufacture them this way. So it, it's, it's not a, a trivial technology, but Basically, they are, they are more efficient in terms of uh, the amount of light they can collect. But anyways, th this, is, this, is this, this is a setting that uh, we have been using in the overwhelming majority of cameras that we manufacture today. And one of the reasons for that is in the mid-90s, mid Eric Fossum from Dartmouth College invented uh, a pixel design that can be manufactured using CMOS technology. And CMOS technology is what we use to manufacture all practically all the chips in, in, in the world. And 
because this fa fabrication capacity is so huge, it is very cheap to manufacture CMOS. And since we are manufacturing CMOS uh, for uh, image sensors, we more or less ride the Moore's law for uh, sensor uh, chips as well. So we, m we double the number of pixels more or less every, uh, every certain number of years. So if you really want to just do plain RGB imaging, I don't think economically you will do anything more viable than this. It is very cheap to manufacture very dense pixel arrays, uh, and we don't need anything more than this. But if you want to do slightly more complicated, uh, I wouldn't say exotic, but slightly more complicated and more interesting types of imaging, you want to, to see more than just these kind of sensors give you, then you need to, and you need, you should, you can, uh, use this combination of different optics, maybe different sensing, different design of the sensor with sl slightly more advanced capabilities and a lot of digital signal processing. Okay? So let me just write it mathematically what we have here. Uh, we have some analog image in this scene. So again, I'm not showing you the full details, but I have an analog image, I'm thinking of it it has some spatial co some some spatial coordinate here that we are sampling let's say on some lattice let's say a regular lattice for for the simplicity of discussion then we have some temporal variable because the scene is changing we are shooting a video of it and this is the discrete frame number and then we have some lambda which stands for the wavelengths because we have different reflective characteristics of the scene at different wavelengths that that what gives us color and typically we sample these as chromatic channels. It would be normally R, G, and B in, in regular cameras. So we have this analog image and we, we sample it to obtain a digital image. So this is just a discrete domain signal that we have already seen. I'm just adding more, uh, more variables to it. We talked about, uh, most of the time, about grayscale images, but you also have different channels and we typically also sample in time. And then it, uh, it undergoes different processes. So first of all, we have convolution with, with, uh, with an impulse response of the optics of the pixel itself, which is called the point spread function. This is what, uh, this is what a delta light source, a point light source, would produce on the surface of the sensor. This is the point spread function. It depends on the depth. I will elaborate on it more. So basically, when you focus your camera on some point, uh, if, you, if you have objects, uh, Close, closer or farther than that point, the point spread function will change. In practice, it will also change depending on your location on the sensor. It will be one PSF at the center and a different PSF in the, in the peripheral regions. Usually, the peripheral regions will suffer from, more, from, from higher quality degradation because of the limitations of the optics. Then we have some, some shutter response. This is how you integrate your image. So, so we, we thought about shutter as a low-pass filter to avoid temporal aliasing when we, when we sample a moving sequence, when we sample a video. So we integrate photons over time. If we don't integrate photons over time, of course, we, we see nothing. So the shutter has to be somehow, there, is a, there are some trade-offs that, we'll, we'll, uh, that we'll need to address. And then we have what is called the quantum efficiency or, or the spectral response of each of the pixels. Uh, typically, we sample three chromatic channels something that we call, we call red, that if this is the wavelength, this is the wavelength, so the, the, the red, the perceived red is here and the perceived blue is here. So the, the red response typically looks like this. So it's not, not red at all. It, it is picked at, at, sh at long wavelengths that we would call it, call it red, but this is by the way how our eye uh, sees red as well. We have some blue, which again is not blue at all, and some green. So there are wide, significantly overlapping spectral, spectral bands that we are taking as chromatic channels. And this more or less mimics the response of the eye, but, but for some applications we might want to do something better, maybe get a better resolution in spectrum, for example. So this, uh, this is what traditional imaging does, and uh, Let's see some limitations of this approach. So first of all, so we have here a few, uh, a few um, uh, design parameters, so to say. We can 
control the optics and therefore PSF, we can control the shutter, we can control the spectral responses, of course within some fabrication uh, constraints. So I would like to address, I'm, I'm using this color code for different, uh, different ingredients of this imaging system, let's see the trade-offs that each of them gives us and I will try to elaborate more on each of them. So first of all, regarding the time response, the shutter, we can do short exposure, we can do long exposure. Short exposure brings with it low SNR. We are integrating less photons. We already learned that uh, in, this in this case, the, the dominant source of noise will be the shot noise. It has Poisson statistics. The SNR goes as the square root of the number of photons you collected, more or less up to some factors. Uh, meaning that if you collected less photons, your image will be noisy. Okay? In case of long exposure, you will have motion blur. We already uh, saw this in, in, in the first home assignment. And the motion blur, uh, will, we can think of it as a PSF, as a point spread function. That if you, integrate, if you have a fast moving object, if you expose your camera to a longer time, it will be blurred. That, that is, of course, an undesired effect. And then we we'll have low temporal resolution. If you want to sample many frames, you cannot sample many frames. If you need to expose each frame for 30 milliseconds, you cannot get higher frame rate than 30 frames per second. Right? So this is one axis re related to time. This axis relates to, to, the, to, this, to the spatial characteristic. We can have small apertures and, and big apertures. Big aperture means that there is a big hole through which the light enters the, the system. And for a small aperture, we again will have low SNR because we collect less light and, we, uh, and therefore we count less photons. For a big aperture, we'll collect more light, so it is actually the SNR will improve greatly, but then we'll have what is called a narrow depth of field. I will elaborate on it more. So the camera will be in focus just on a small range of depth, and what is beyond that range will, will be blurred out of focus. Another, spa another spatial dimension, we can play with the pixel size. We can have small pixels, we, have we can have many dense uh, small pixels, so we can decrease the pixel pitch that delta that I had in the, in, the, in the formula. So we can have very, very uh, dense sampling of the pixels, but then each pixel will be small. It will collect less light, and then we'll have low SNR again, right? So basically all this region is low SNR. For big pixels, we'll have better SNR, but we'll have low spatial resolution unless we make the sensor big. But if we make the sensor big and we want to keep the same uh, uh, field of view, we need to increase the form factor of the camera. We'll need to basically blow it up. And then it, for example, will not fit into the thickness of, of your smartphone. And even today, this is the thickest part of your smartphone. The camera is actually thicker than the device itself. We have another dimension related to the spectral characteristic of the, of the camera. We can have a uh, wide spectral response like we have in typical RGB cameras, or we, we can have narrow spectral response. And then if we have narrow spectral response, we, maybe we can have more chromatic channels. This is called multispectral or hyperspectral imaging. Uh, so with wide response, we have a low spectral resolution. We cannot distinguish between red and orange. This is just basically how I perceive this, but we, ca we can have a multitude of different spectral distributions of light that we perceive as orange. We can have something that peaks at that wavelength. We can have a monochromatic light source. We can have a few deltas that, uh, that are perceived as orange, and all of them are confused by, by, by a camera with just three wide spectral bands. If we have a narrow spectral response, imagine that you have a very narrow band filter that filters a lot of light. Most of the light gets filtered out. Again, we have a low SNR. Okay? So these are these are the typical limitations, the typical trade-offs that you need to take into account in, uh, in this traditional imaging set, uh, setup. And I would, like to, I would like to challenge whether we can do, we, whether we necessarily need to make these hard uh, uh, trade-offs. Maybe we can do better by designing a different hardware and by designing, uh, by accompanying it with, uh, with digital uh, image processing algorithms. Okay, so basically, from, from uh, traditional imaging, I would like to switch to something that is called computational imaging. We'll put some general type of optics, something that can be completely crazy. In optics, we can do many things. Uh, it can be something that does more than just a single lens. Uh, 
And then I can put some crazier sensor. Typically, it will be a linear sensor, but maybe if I have time, I will mention something related to nonlinear sensing as well. And then what we measure here, there will be some set of measurements. They will not be human intelligible. You just look at them, it looks garbage. You don't see an image. And then you pass them through a, through a computational pipeline, through a computational process that produces at the end a digital image. Okay? So this is called computational imaging and computational photography. And uh, again, mathematically, we can think of it in these terms, we have some, again, analog image. We, we shouldn't have these, these things anymore. Okay? We have some analog image. We process it with some generalized optics and sensors. I'm putting them all together into this response P. And usually, their combined, uh, their combined action is a, linear, uh, is a linear system. So I'm still writing this as an integral. And then we have a set of measurements. These are digital measurements, which are not human intelligible again. And we need to run some potentially complicated algorithm that I'm denoting here by this innocent f, which will give us back uh, a digital image. Okay? And again, under this umbrella, I will show you many crazy designs of cameras. And again, if you just want to do regular RGB imaging, you can probably do nothing better than than uh, than regular CMOS again because of the because of the commercial considerations. But if you want to do more complicated imaging, then these designs start uh, s start seeming very appealing. Okay, so let's address the temporal component first. So basically, I would like to concentrate on this shutter response here. So we can control the shutter. We can control how we integrate light in time. So typically, this is done electronically. All the pixels in the sensor, or row by row, if we do rolling shutter, uh, we, we bring them out of reset, so, so to say. So basically, they start collecting light. We start counting photons. And then we lock the, the number of photons that was collected and read them out through, uh, through an analog circuit, amplify, digitize. And this is what comes out as a digital image. So again, if we have short exposure, we have low SNR, but we can resolve uh, high temporal details. If we have long exposure, we have better SNR, as you can see here, but we have motion blur, and the temporal resolution is bad. Okay. Now, if you think, now if you think of um, how motion blur looks like, suppose you have an object moving with constant velocity, v, and you integrate it, it will contribute this kind of a box filter to the point spread function, right? You know it better than me already. So in the frequency, it will look like a sink, right? And the sink has zeros here. And these zeros mean that information is irreparably lost. Okay? So, so theoretically, you have a very slow decay here, so it's not, it, it's not a terrible function to invert. You can do deconvolution with this function, but it has zeros. And close to these zeros, the noise will overwhelm your signal, so basically there will be a region around the zeros that you cannot faithfully recover. So what you can do, can you view your scene through a different set of PSFs that still look like a lot of motion blur, but they have zeros at different places? So and then, if you have non-overlapping zeros in the frequency domain, so if you can design your shutter response function in such a way that it will build a PSF that has zeros in different places, then, then you are done. Then you, can, uh, then you can recover, then you can solve this deconvolution problem efficiently. And this is what is done by the idea of what is called flutter shutter or coded exposure. You, you divide your in long integration time this is, your, this is your exposure time, let's say from 0 to, to Tx. You divide it into m shorter periods, like in burst imaging, and you create here some crazy pattern of, of the shutter, and here you create some different pattern of the shutter in such a way that the PSFs uh, have non-overlapping zeros in, in the frequency domain. Okay? And if you do this, so this is, first of all, how the short shutter will look like. 
no, don't practically don't see anything. It's a very short, uh, short shutter. When you do long shutter, that looks like this. This is a 200 millisecond shutter. You see a lot of light, but it's all blurred, right? Now, this is an example. I'm not drawing the exact waveform that was used here. It has many more uh, uh, ups and downs. This is just a schematic representation. You will see still a lot of blur. You see the blur is different. You can actually take some thin objects and you can probably see some hint of the PSF here, or maybe here. You can actually probably even decipher the code that encoded the, the shutter. But then you have, basically, you observe your image through different PSFs. Of course, you, in, you read out multiple times along these, uh, these intervals. So you, you, ev every time you integrated more, more light, so you have more light than just in short shutter, and you also have different PSFs. Now you, you stack this into uh, a set of measurements. You solve the deconvolution problem. You know already how to solve it, for example, with some sparsity constraint. And this is the reconstructed image. OK? Looks nice. So we used some very mild modification of the, of the, of the in this case, of the sensor electronics. Maybe you can even do it with existing sensors. And, uh, and then we reconstruct it. By the way, in this specific setting, they didn't want to mess up with, with electronics. They just created a ferroelectric shutter in front, of the, in front of the aperture. But of course, this should be better than uh, in the, uh, the sensor side. OK? Any questions? So let's t talk about the spatial response now. This is the point spread function due to the optics. And we had uh, the trade-off between small aperture and big aperture. Small aperture gave us low SNR, but uh, wide depth of field. Uh, big aperture gave narrow depth of field, but much better SNR. We'll, we'll talk about depth of field in, in, a, in a few minutes. And then we had this trade-off between many small pixels. If we have many small pixels, we have low SNR, but you have good spatial resolution. If you have a few big pixels, you have much better SNR, but you have low spatial resolution. Is this actually a trade-off? Is, is, is this how we want to, uh, to trade-off between spatial resolution and SNR? Maybe we can do better. And let's take Let's take this uh, to the extreme. Let's reduce the number of pixels just to one. Okay, but we somehow need to we somehow need to resolve spatial details. So instead of resolving spatial details, let's modulate them with high spatial frequency. So we put a controlled mask here. In the original design, they actually used an array of micro mirrors that can be in two states, on and off. Uh, or you can use an LCD screen, essentially, here in front, of the, in front of the camera. Or you can actually do it in sensor electronics that I will show you in a second. So you create a controlled, uh, uh, basically, a set of patterns. So, so the light goes through some, I'm not drawing it, but you have some imaging lens here. It creates an image of your world on this uh, modulator. This is a light modulator. Think of it as, a, as, a, as an analog mixer. So then part of the light is blocked. Part of the light goes through at different locations. You collect all this light, and you throw it on a single photo detector, on a single pixel. And then you expose it, and you read out the signal. So of course, you have a lot of light that goes to this detector. Basically, all your aperture is concentrated on a single pixel, so the exposure can be extremely short. But you need many such exposures, because you need to, uh, each time to change the mask. And of course, this stream of, uh, this stream of uh, measurements is completely unintelligible, right? So it doesn't look like an image. It looks like a time signal. So you need an image reconstruction algorithm. Now, how does this look like? This looks like exactly like compressed sensing, right? So we are, we are computing. We are computing inner products of our image with some set of measurement functions, right? So basically, I can think of this as AM inner product with F. Okay, this is YM, the measurement Y. Okay, and you can, of course, you can design different sensing functions. We talked about it when I talked about compressed sensing. 
just IAD random pattern works very well, but you can actually learn the best patterns. You can, you can do a lot of interesting design here. Uh, again, up to what your modulator allows you to do. Typically, binary modulation is much easier to do. So you, you, we talked about Gaussian matrices most of the time. It's difficult to implement Gaussian modulation, especially because it has negative values that you, can do, um, you cannot do on light intensity. But uh, you can just do, uh, you can just have zero and ones let's say, with equal probability, uh, it will also satisfy the RIP property that we, that we discussed. So basically, this is a single pixel camera, and it also enjoys all the properties of compressed sensing. So this is an optical system that reconstructs an image of this letter R from 100% measurements. So basically, it's like this aperture, this aperture function looks like an array of pixels. So you can turn only one pixel to be on and block the rest and just sweep through this aperture with one, a single delta function. So you're going to measure, to do your measurement in the standard basis, so to say. And once you accumulate these measurements, of course, this will be a, an extremely long process, you get this quality of an image. It, again, it's a prototype system that was developed by, by Rick Baranuk's uh, group uh, at Rice University. Now, if you do Compressed sensing, this is just 16% of measurements. We get a good quality, and this is just 2% of measurements. The quality is not as great as before, but you are sampling one, almost, you are sampling 50 times less information than, than you, would, uh, you would normally do. Of course, if you just sample in the standard basis, you will not see anything. The image will be full of holes, but here you are you're using the, the, the advantages of compressed sensing. Okay? Another example with a color image. I think it, it is quite incredible. Now, you can do, you can actually combine, so we somehow we, until now, we talked about the shutter response and the spatial modulation uh, as two separate functions. They don't need to be separate anymore. You can actually modulate uh, both space and time simultaneously. So this is one design of this kind that was developed at Duke University. You have a random mask, a fixed pattern mask. So you just produce a random matrix with zeros and ones, and you move it by this piezoelectric motor in front of your lens. So because, because this is a, an IAD mask, if you shift it by one pixel, it will be another IAD mask totally uncorrelated with the previous one, right? So basically, we have many, many uncorrelated rows uh, uh, of a matrix. Of course, here the motion is continuous. And you integrate during that time. So again, I'm, here I'm ignoring the, 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 the PSF. Uh, you can actually ignore the PSF if you put this mask very close to the sensor. Uh, they put it in the aperture just because it was much easier to design it optically. So basically, you have this aperture mask that looks like a random pattern. And you move it with some constant velocity by this piezo drive. And uh, again, an IAD mask does a terrific job. So what, what you can see here, this is a regular exposure of a rotating disk, very fast rotating disk at 30 frames per second. So you see it's blurred, completely blurred. This is the, so basically you want to obtain higher, higher uh, temporal resolution. You want to actually get a, a high frame rate video out of this. If you expose for, uh, let's say one, uh, one millisecond instead of 30 milliseconds, you will get very, a very small amount of light. So the image will be very dark and noisy. And this is a coded exposure. So you can actually see that the motion of the mask was in this vertical direction. You expose for the same amount of time. So there is terrible motion blur, but it is mod you see it is modulated. It is modulated by the zeros and ones in the mask. You see basically you have a zero here and you have a one here. A zero here and a one a zero here, a zero here, a one here, and so on, okay? So when you create this sequence of compressed measurements, you can actually reconstruct a high temporal resolution movie. So here they, they overlay the grid on these results just to show that, that this, this there is, you, first of all, you see that there is a letter D here on the disk. You didn't see a D before, right? Just for comparison. Can you see a D here? No. So this is a D, and you see it is actually moving. Okay, it rotates in this direction. So by just taking this coded 
spatiotemporal exposure. So you you modulate both the uh, both the pixels and the shutter. You create this kind of high frame rate uh, high frame rate capability, but you you integrate the amount of photons that would correspond to a long exposure. Okay, so you you have good SNR and uh, you have good temporal resolution. So you see, it's not a hard trade-off if you work differently. Okay. Another example, uh, you can actually, basically you can do the same idea. This piezo drive uh, is it's quite difficult to manufacture. It is, it is expensive. It, it has a quite significant power consumption. It, has, uh, signif it significantly increases the form factor of the camera. But you can actually do this in electronics. If you could wire the shutter for every pixel separately and just select the waveform individually for every pixel so you open up you open and shut the 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 image collect uh, the image co the photon collection of of a pixel during the integration time and you do it differently for it, for every pixel if you can build such such a, such a sensor then basically you can do this idea by simply having shutter sequences that are individual for every pixel and in practice uh, you don't really work with IAD patterns because that requires to drive each pixel with an individual sequence. Where do you store this information? How do you how do you put it into the sensor while it integrates light? It would be extremely expensive, uh, not only in terms of the number of wires you have, but also in terms of the power consumption of the sensor. So you do some smarter tricks. You have a lot more constraints. You have more structure. For example, you can do some kind of a shift register that that uh, moves your uh, pseudo-random sequence from one pixel to another pixel, but then basically all the neighbor p pixels will be uncorrelated. There are many interesting considerations here that uh, intimately relate to the, to the silicon design. But what you see uh, as a consequence, this is your single exposure. You expose a single image that is coded both in space and time, and then you can see from it you can reconstruct from a, this long, ex long coded exposure, you can reconstruct a moving sequence, as in the previous case of uh, a rotating disk. Okay, so I think it's incredibly cool. Okay, so you don't see it without the computational process. The image is still intelligible, but you don't see that it is a video. The video is not intelligible. You need a reconstruction process to obtain it. Okay, any questions? Okay, so here, a good question. So the question was, what sensor was used here? So the sen here, it was a regular sensor, and they just put an, uh, an LCOS modulator in front of the aperture, which is, uh, as a proof of concept, it's a nice idea. Uh, but uh, quite recently, uh, Kiros Kotorakos from uh, Toronto University actually designed his own VLSI that has individual shutter for every pixel with, of course, lots of constraints. Actually, they, they, they have two diodes in every pixel. So when you turn, so you have left and right, let's say. So when, one, when the left shutter is on, the right shutter is off, and, and, and vice versa. So you're always collecting light, but in these complementary sequences. Uh, so they had, of course, a lot of constraints on how you can con control pixels, but you can do things like this. OK? So let's talk about this axis now about the, the impact of the aperture size on our, Im Im on our imaging process. Any, any questions until now? I, again, I'm, 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 uh, sometimes I'm diving into the, the optical side. This is not a, a course about optics, but I think, I hope you at least see the general idea of how it works. So let's, let me explain to you uh, a phenomenon that is called depth of field. So this is this is our standard imaging setting. I'm again thinking of it as a as a thin lens. In in the case of a of a real aperture system of lenses, you can think of it as an effective thin lens that uh, that produces it plus some some uh, aberrations that 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 happen. So I have an aperture of diameter d. So this diameter will be d. And Basically, in a real, in a real uh, optical system, there is a motor here that can drive this 
lens tube up and down. And by, by doing this, we are focusing the camera on a certain depth in the scene. So I would like to focus my camera on this depth z0. I have the I have basically the famous thin lens equation that tells me that one over z uh, zero, which is basically this distance, plus one over z sensor, which is this distance, equals one over f, which is the focal length of the of the uh, of the lens. Okay. So I will place my sensor at an appropriate distance from the lens in such a way that everything, basically that all the lights that come from this point will be collected at a single point on the sensor. And then we'll say that our, our uh, imaging system is in focus at depth z z0. But then if we have some object that is closer to z0, it will go through this aperture and, it will, and the light will the light will fall behind, will be focused behind the sensor. So you have some, what is called a circle of confusion here on the sensor. And this is a blur. And this is what happens when, we usually due to aging, we suffer from long-sightedness, far-sightedness, and we basically our eye collects the light behind the retina. And we need correcting glasses to correct this, to correct this uh, uh, disadvantage. And the same will happen if we put an object farther from the point at which we are focused, then the light will be collected before the sensor and again we'll have this blur. And this, is, this happens, for example, I have glasses because I, I suffer from short-sightedness and basically my, my lens collects the light uh, before the retina. So we can actually m measure the diameter of this circle of confusion, the blur radius, let me denote it by C, it will be essentially one minus the absolute value of one minus the ratio between z zero and the actual depth at which the object is located. So if the object is located at z zero, of course, in this idealized setting, the blur radius will be zero. Otherwise, it will grow. It will grow until it fills the size of the entire aperture, and the proportion coefficient is one over n, which is called the focal number. It's the dimensionless quantity that uh, measures the ratio between the focal length and the diameter of the aperture. Okay, And the depth of field is defined as the range uh, in which this blur radius falls below some acceptable threshold. So you're not terribly out of focus. And as you can see, the bigger is your aperture, the bigger will be uh, this uh, blur circle. Right? And as a result, your depth of field will be narrow. So there will be only a small interval of depths at which the amount of blur doesn't exceed a certain threshold. So this is called narrow depth of field. So again, big aperture means small focal number. And by the way, you don't necessarily need to, to drill a big hole in your camera. You can do it with optics. You can create a lens with a, with a big curvature, for example, that collects more light. But this is complicated. It's difficult to manufacture small uh, uh, small focal numbers. I think one of the smallest focal number lenses that was used in cinema is 0 0.8. It is incredibly expensive. It costs more than, than all the cameras combined. Uh, and, but the, of course the advantage of having a bigger aperture is that you collect more light. Actually you collect more light uh, as d squared because, of the, because you collect an, by, by an area of the aperture and uh, you have better SNR. Okay. So this is how the circle of confusion, this is how the blur radius looks like, but actually a real lens doesn't have a circle or uh, uh, point spread function. It has some more general, uh, ge general shape of an aperture that contributes to this point spread function. And basically what depth gives you is just the scaling of this function. And the scaling here just, just guarantees that the integral of, over this point spread function remains the same. So for example, you can have this point spread function at one depth and this point spread function at another depth. Okay, so it's the same shape, I'm just scaling it. And you can see it in this visualization at z0 you are in focus, so the amount of blur is zero. And then as you go closer to the aperture or farther from the aperture, it gradually grows to the actual aperture size. Okay, so you're, you're increasing the amount of blur. And this specific shape of the aperture is called, called the bouquet. Uh, 
in photography. So this is a visualization. It doesn't need to be circle. So this is, for example, a pentagonal bouquet. You can find it typically in many cameras. It can be pentagonal or hexagonal. And you can see it here. This is the PSF of a single very distant point light source. So it's very small, like a star, and very distant. So it gets blown up by this point spread function to what you see here. Okay, so this is the bouquet effect. It's actually beautiful. So people try to produce it on purpose. By taking a, a photo, you see the camera is focused here on the foreground. And the background is very far, it is blurred. So basically, if I go to this, this is the foreground and the light sources come from here. So a light source, a point light source gets convolved with this point spread function. Okay? This is called the, the bouquet. Now, how do we, within these limitations, so we want a big aperture, actually having a big aperture gives you a, a lot of uh, a scenario advantage, but then you will need to deal with this narrow depth of field. Typically, I would like to have the image, unless I'm an artist, I would like the, the image to be in focus at, as, uh, bigger, as big an uh, interval of, de of depth as possible. Again, unless you want to create this artistic effect. But how do we recover a sharp image from this blur? And again, remember that this blur is depth dependent. And this looks like, like a deconvolution problem, right? We can actually measure the PSF in the lab. The problem is that it is a blind deconvolution problem because the PSF depends on depth and you don't know the depth. So you need to solve simultaneously for f and z in some way. And z will be just some kind of a nuisance. You estimate it, but you don't use it, at least in this application. You, 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 you care about f. You want to estimate f. But you, you basically, the problem is blind because there is some unknown parameter that you need to estimate together with, with your f. And you, of course, you put a prior. You want your image to satisfy a prior. But the problem is that if you blur your image slightly, it will still satisfy most of the priors quite well. So if you make some mistake in depth, well, the image will look bad, but it will still be, still be uh, close to the minimum of this problem. So basically, the, pro the, problem, the, the, the landscape of this objective function will be quite flat, close to the minimum, at least in those directions where you introduce some blur. And one of the ways to do it to overcome this problem, to increase sensitivity. Can you design a PSF here that when you blow it up a little bit by going out of focus, it will create an image that looks terribly distant from a natural image. So it will look completely different from a natural image. It will, will, the prior will, this prior, this penalty that penalizes for not belonging to the subspace of your images of interest will suddenly grow very fast. So it will, you will try to minimize that amount of the spread of that point spread function in order to, uh, to have this, this prior term low. Okay? And one of the ways to do it is by, to code the aperture. So this is the point spread function of a typical aperture, like this pentagonal bouquet that I showed you before. And let's just put some crazy mask here. And this is how your point spread function will look like. If you convolve an image with this point spread function, it will not look like a, like a natural image, unless it is very narrow. And it is very narrow if you guessed your uh, depth right. So you will be extremely sensitive to, to mistakes in depth in that blind deconvolution problem. Okay? And here is an example. This is a work by, by Nat Levine, I think, at that time at MIT. Uh, you can see here, again, the, the, the effects here are slight. So just look at these regions that are out of focus. And these are the deconvolved results. And if you do deconvolution with the standard bouquet, with the same aperture size, you will have a lot of artifacts because you didn't guess the, the, the depth correctly. Okay? But what is the disadvantage of this mask? Just have a look. It, basically, the light efficiency is horrible. You pass just half of your light. You have a big aperture, but you're, you're blocking half of the light. In this case, it's about 50% duty cycle, so to say. So basically, the light is blocked, and this is a very undesired phenomenon. So you, you work really hard on getting a big aperture, but then you throw half of the light. This is, this is quite, quite inefficient. So what you can do, you can, you can do a different trick. And this is something that... I did with my student a couple of years ago. So 
before before showing what what we did, when you design a lens, you typically work very hard on designing the geometry and the refractive indices of all the optical surfaces in such a way that the same PSF characterizes all wavelengths. So you you don't have those uh, uh, rainbow edges of images that are called chromatic aberrations. So if you just take a, a, a thick glass glass lens that was not manufactured precisely, you will see a lot of uh, rainbow effects in an image, right? So just just try looking through a, gla uh, through a, a glass bowl at, at the surrounding world. You will see a lot of uh, uh, color artifacts. So basically, this is an extreme case of chromatic aberrations that I'm drawing here. Essentially, the PSFs of the red, green, and blue channels are completely off. They are not aligned. So this is a poor lens. You actually need to work hard to design such a bad lens. But if you work, if you if you want to take advantage of this phenomenon, you can actually introduce. Well, basically, you will have this PSF that depends on the wavelength, or if you integrate three chromatic channels, it will be, be a different PSF for each chromatic channel. The advantage for our deconvolution problem is that having different PSF and with 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 known relation of the amount uh, about the amount of blur as function of depth. So you have, for example, more blur in red and less blur in green, and some s very small amount of uh, blur in blue, for example, at a certain depth and a different relation at different depths. You actually you are you are getting more sensitive to mistakes in depth. You have more information about depth than if you just blur with a single PSF. Okay, and basically we just we we use the, we built this this setup with uh, with a phase mask that introduces phase delays to the incoming wave front of light. And in this way, the PSF changes as the function of the wavelength. Of course, we are integrating over sufficiently wide spectral bands, so you have some kind of an effective PSF that, that is integrated over a range of wavelengths. So we essentially, we introduce controlled uh, chromatic aberrations. We design a diffractive element. It's just, just a th thin layer of glass with etched raised and, and lowered patterns. The advantage of this design is that it has almost perfect light efficiency. You're not blocking any light. It, well, some light might get reflected from it, but with sufficiently good manufacturing, it passes practically all, all the light that comes in. And you can actually build it on as part of, the, of one of, of your lenses. It can be manufactured together with, let's say, the first optical surface in your imaging system. And as a result, you see a chromatically aberrated image, so like poor imaging system. But then you can solve a deconvolution problem with now three different PSFs. So you are looking at, at the world through three different PSFs. You have more information. And you can, and you can get uh, extended depth of field images. This is how a clear aperture looks uh, like when you focus on the background. You see nearby objects are blurred. You can see blur here, you can see blur here. This is actually a resolution target. And you can see that the image is mar much sharper when it is imaged through this uh, phase encoded aperture, of course, followed by the convolution process. But since you are solving this deconvolution process, you have you are actually looking for f when you are doing extended depth of field imaging. And z is just a nuisance. You don't really care for it, but you still need to solve for it. Okay, but let's reverse the roles. I can do depth imaging. I can infer depth by by measuring them by by knowing how my uh, camera blurs the image at different depths, and by estimating the most in focus image according to my prior, I can actually tell you by at which depth you obtained the highest focus, or maybe the other way around. Uh, what was the depth that gave me the PSF that I'm observing? And from, from that, if you have sufficiently interesting features in your image, not just some white area, you can actually estimate uh, quite reasonable depth maps, as you can see here. Okay? And of course, you can do it with a coded aperture as well. So basically, anything that has a point spread function that is very sensitive to depth can be used to do this kind of passive single shot, single aperture depth estimation. For example, you can use it to segment foreground from background. Yes? 
so, so I, I, I use this face mask, I use the, this face mask to, uh, to generate chroma, uh, tightly controlled chromatic aberrations. So I can of course do it in ref refractive optics, but I have less control. So but actually I have a lens, so we started with standard lenses for which we measured their actual chromatic aberrations. We corrected for them in the phase mask and we added our own chromatic aberrations that created uh, basically this, this point spread function. And you can optimize it for a certain range of, uh, of interest. And actually you, you, can, you can view this forward model with the parameters of the, po of the, of the mask. So th we have rings of different diameters and different elevations. You can actually learn this mask. So the same way you, you can learn a sensing operator, you can learn the parameters of this forward operator together with learning this image reconstruction operator. And actually it improves the overall performance of the system if you learn, if you learn them simultaneously. Okay, let's do a break and then see some, some other crazy designs. Okay, back to back to our sensors and the imaging systems. Um, so just just to conclude about this uh, this this specific design. So again, it can be used both as a passive depth camera and as a, uh, as an extended depth of field camera. And uh, because of using b basically, you can have a bigger aperture, more light, therefore uh, smaller form factor and basically returning the amount, returning the sharp image by computational means so you can actually do you can break that uh, vicious cycle of uh, trading off the exposure time the the aperture size and the uh, spatial resolution and hence the the size of the pixel by basically doing a smarter uh, smarter design of uh, of an imaging device So the computation, uh, uh, so again, all the sensors that, or most of the sensors that I showed to you uh, are still at uh, prototype level. Basically, these are uh, academic wor uh, works from different universities across the globe. Uh, of course, the computation there was not uh, the main, uh, that was not a main design consideration. So assuming that we have enough compute power. Here in this specific work, we started with running it on a GPU, then we constructed an FPGA uh, real-time system that worked at, at 20 frames per second at uh, full HD resolution. Uh, again, this was not uh, the main target of, of the project, but you can, you can run it in real time. Of course, when you, uh, when you make a product out of it, uh, for example, for a cell phone, the amount of computation that you need to spend will have a huge impact on, on the viability of, of this product because you don't want to drain your battery in five minutes. On a, on a smartphone. So computation is, is costly. I don't think we are still yet there with, uh, with these kind of imaging sensors, but many of the sensors that I showed to you, they're actually, they have been licensed to different commercial entities, to different companies that try to do something with them. Not necessarily mainstream imaging, maybe some, some more complicated and more exotic imaging. For example, you don't really need a one pixel camera if you're doing regular RGB imaging, because it's very easy to manufacture dense, pixel arrays in CMOS. But for example, if you want to do some kind of long wave infrared sensing, basically there is some kind of serendipity in the fact that uh, the response of our eye closely coincides with the, with the quantum efficiency curve of, of silicon. And plus the fact that silicon is used for mainstream chips. So essentially for regular uh, visible uh, range imaging, you can use silicon, and this is a very, si very simple, very inexpensive process. When you go beyond that, for example, to uh, to uh, n to near infrared and to far infrared ranges, let's say beyond one thousand nanometers, silicon sees nothing. Basically, it's transparent to infrared light. And then you need to go to different processes, use different semiconductors like uh, indium phosphate, gallium arsenide. That is incredibly more costly. It can blow up your, the price of, of a uh, $1 camera to $10,000 or to $100,000. And if you go to longer waves, uh, you need to use completely different technologies, like, for example, an array of microbolometers uh, uh, manufactured in, in MEMS. This is what is done for thermal imaging today. Uh, 
If you go to even to longer wavelengths like terahertz imaging, which is sort of halfway between uh, RF and infrared, then ma manufacturing an array of pixels becomes a completely unviable task. It is too expensive. And then you might have just one pixel, one sensor that costs you less, and you create some kind of uh, light modulation in the aperture or, or on the sensor. And, and for those applications, uh, it is much more appealing to use these computational designs. And in, in fact, the company that licensed the technology from Rice, they uh, focus on this kind of uh, infrared imaging and farther. Okay, so let's talk about, if we are talking about uh, spectral, uh, basically about spectral responses, let's also talk a little bit about what, we, what can we do with, uh, with the spectral response, with the quantum efficiency of the camera. So again, there is a trade-off between the width of your spectral band. So if you have a few wide bands, like in regular RGB cameras, you will have low spectral resolution. And if you have ma many narrow filter uh, spectral bands, so here you have something like this. I'm just drawing schematically. And here you would probably have something like this. Very narrow band, practically non-overlapping uh, spectral responses. But then every band integrates less light because you're blocking part of your photons. So you have lower SNR. And then somehow, somehow you need to sense this spectral information. So either you trade it off with spatial resolution or, or, or with temporal resolution. And you can do a lot with multispectral or hyperspectral imaging. Of course, you cannot display this on a regular display or you cannot display it with a regular pair of eyes. We, we are not built to sense more than three chromatic channels. We, we, we don't have this capability. So you can, you can for example, use this pseudo color to uh, highlight some of the spectral bands. So here, for example, using this kind of visible and uh, near infrared imaging, you can clearly see the blood vessel structure uh, of, this, of this arm. You can actually even see the difference very sharply in near infrared between oxygenated blood and, and deoxygenated blood. You can actually measure the, the heartbeat frequency using simple optical sensors. They, they basically, all the, all the watches that measure your heart rate do exactly this kind of uh, sensing. And for example, this is another uh, multispectral or hyperspectral camera from NASA that images the sun at different frequency bands. So here they are superimposed in, uh, in a single image. And you can see that, that different details or different processes at different depths in our star, they, they are visible in different wavelengths. So it's, a, it's an incredible scientific tool uh, besides just the fact that you can in at least under controlled illumination conditions, you can actually see the the spectral response of your of your uh, of your material. So you can classify materials, for example, different different types of stuff respond differently to to light. And if you take, for example, in the infrared band where different molecules absorb infrared radiation in different way, you can actually uh, infer the chemical composition. Of materials. Of course, it's not an easy task, but this is something that spectrometry does. Now, typical hyperspectral imaging works like one of these two designs. Of course, there are many more, more interesting designs, but typically you just take a few exposures through a color wheel of filters. So you have many narrow band filters here. It's not many here, it's just, just five. Uh, and this gives you the different, different uh, images of the same object with, through different filters, and therefore you get uh, potentially very high uh, uh, spectral resolution. Another possibility, you can just take a two-dimensional image. So let's take a two-dimensional image. This is a two-dimensional sensor. You put a refractive element in front of it and a cylindrical lens. So a cylindrical lens will collect the light from your scene and it will uh, so it will it will give you good spatial resolution in this direction, but in this direction, basically, a light ray will be spread over the entire horizontal axis. So basically, you will don't you will not resolve any details in the horizontal direction. But here you will put a refractive grating or a prism that will decompose this light into spectral bands. So 
across this this axis you now have uh, lambda you have basically spectral resolution of course you need to make sure that your sensor here can sense the different wavelengths so for silicon it will be a very very limited range of uh, uh, very limited range of uh, uh, spectral bands or very limited sp uh, um, range of lambdas but you can use different sensing technologies here it can be a silicon sensor in this part it can be for example a thermal imaging uh, system in this part so basically you you sacrifice completely the resolution in one direction and you have a line camera so a camera that sees a line but then it gives you a very high spectral resolution now you put this thing on a satellite and you just sweep the earth actually you don't need to basically the earth move be, uh, moves below right so you you're just viewing this line and you have excellent spectral resolution and then the earth moves below and this is how hyperspectral aerial air and satellite images are obtained this is called a push broom camera or a sweeping camera okay so it's of course it's good for this kind of imaging of mostly static objects okay so you can fly usually it is usually done for airborne cameras so you put it on a plane you, you you just fly on a straight line or you put it on a satellite and then it just orbits the earth and and does this image in stripes but you can do you can use essentially the idea of a single pixel uh, camera but now you add some dispersive element here that will decompose the white light into into uh, frequency bands so this is a paper that was published by a Chinese group a few years ago in Nature. What they what they did, uh, they created a quite sophisticated dispersive element here that created many tiny images in narrow frequency bands on this uh, on this uh, uh, aperture. Then from that point on, they worked like a single pixel camera. So you can actually put here more than one pixel. You can put a few sensors and a single optical element that collects the light uh, uh, to all of them that can be sensitive can respond to different spectral bands so basically you have an excellent uh, response excellent quantum efficiency for a very wide range of uh, lambdas of, of wavelengths but you are essentially you are modulating both in space and in lambda so you are mixing together pixels from different locations and from different wavelengths and then, of course, using compressing sensing techniques, you can reconstruct a multispectral or hyperspectral image. So here, this is an RGB image of uh, of this toy, and you can see the different, basically, monochromatic images for uh, different spectral bands. For example, you can see that so these these 670 correspond. Basically, this is a long wavelength. It, it goes to the red. So this is the red side of the spectrum and this is the blue side of the spectrum and green in between so you can see the red basically all the all the violet and the rose uh, i mean the pink and the yellow they have more response in the long wavelengths and they look very dark in the short wavelengths and for example the 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 green has the highest response somewhere somewhere in the, in the in the mid range of the spectrum as as expected right and again here here they just did a reconstruction for eight spectral bands you can do more with this design now let's i would like to mention you one uh, uh, one more idea so when we are when we are imaging uh, the world we are actually measuring the response the reflected light that comes from some light source from the sun for example or from this artificial light this light impinges from an from an object so the object has a surface here's the incoming light the surface has some normal and there will be some light distribution that returns from the object and basically the directivity pattern of this distribution is called the brdf the bidirectional uh, reflectivity function for example a metal surface a mirror will have a delta in that function the light will return only from a very narrow direction that is exactly equal to the to the incidence angle right and a diffuse surface like a piece of paper will 
will distribute the reflected light evenly in all directions. Okay? But basically what we are measuring is not the, the coefficient that tells us how much light reflects. This is called the albedo. Uh, but it measures basically the, 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 the albedo times that uh, reflectivity function according to the geometry of the scene. So according to the direction of the light source, according to the normal of the, of the, of the, um, of the surface, according to the imaging direction, and according to that particular reflectivity function. Okay, so this, this is called reflectivity. So what we, are, what we are actually measuring is this ambient illumination that can depend on lambda because it can be a colored, colored illumination. And the reflectivity that again depends on lambda. We might have an object that absorbs some wavelength and reflects some other wavelength, and therefore we have basically this color response. Now, what if we control the source of light? So we have active illumination. And this is not exotic, right? Is it exotic? We use it all the time. We use it in flash photography. We bring with us our, our, our source of light, we operate it while we are taking an image. But we can do more. So first of all, let's think of some illumination source that we are putting close to our camera. We can control its response, let's say it has some response in lambda, but we can control, we can modulate the source of light in time. Okay? So we are going to send, a, we are going to send our light the speed of light is extremely high, but it's finite. It's a finite quantity. So the photons will take some time to travel. Then they will impinge on the objects. They will have. We will take some time to to return back. So there will be some delay. So I I started I, st I started sending light at time t equals zero. It will take the, a certain amount of time to return back, and this time of flight it will be twice the distance to the object. I'm writing R instead of Z, because when we are imaging in this direction, this is Z and this is R. So we care about actually the, the length of the path that the light took. To be completely, completely rigorous, I also need to put a delay by one time R in, in this part as well. And then, of course, the light will decay proportionally to one over R squared. Obviously, right? So this is a manifestation of the fact that we live in a three-dimensional universe, right? This is the, the surface of a sphere in 3D. So there will be a delay because of the distance, and there will be a decay because of the distance, okay? So if we, so let's say we send a short pulse of light, and then we control our shutter, we wait a certain amount of time, then exposed to a very brief period, we, have, we can have time-resolved imaging. We can open our shutter for just photons coming from this band of uh, depth. And we, it, is, it can be actually quite incredible. Here you can see how light propagates through medium. Can you see it? So here the shutter was gated to a femtosecond level to, to obtain this temporal resolution. Of course, in order to do this, you need an extremely powerful light source, otherwise you don't collect any photons. So instead of doing this, you can do, uh, the, uh, you can do a trick called, uh, called uh, uh, pulse compression that is done in, uh, in radars, for example. You can send a much longer sequence that has a certain waveform. When you match, match it with a matching waveform, it will concentrate in time. So in, uh, then the peak energy that you need to transmit will be much, much shorter. And this is actually how these images were obtained. Otherwise, you would need an incredibly powerful laser to, uh, to illuminate the scene. So you can have time-resolved uh, time resolved imaging. What is interesting is when you put some scattering medium in front of your, of, in front of your object, which is very relevant, for example, in, in, in cars, when you're when you have some fog or some mist or some rain in front of you. This is scattering medium. So there will be some photons from your light source that go straight to the object and return straight to your camera. And they take the shortest path. And because of scattering, there will be basically multiple paths. Light will travel back, but it will take a longer path. So if you use time-resolved imaging, you can transform an image like this into an image like this. So you're just getting your shutter, you're of course sending a pulse of light, you're actively illuminating the scene here, in this case, in near-infrared band, and you are gating your shutter to get 
just that uh, particular range of distances, so all this scattered light will arrive much later, and you are not going to collect it. So it will not uh, degrade the contrast of your image. It depends a lot on, on the properties of fog, but basically you can block effectively a lot of these multipath uh, multi uh, uh, light, and therefore the contrast will be much better. So it, it, it is, it you will not remove it totally, but you can reduce it significantly. Okay? So again, this is a, an actual system that is manufactured by the way. So this is an academic publication, but they, they're actually building sensors for cars, for autonomous vehicles, based on, on this technology. Now, if you have time-resolved imaging, you can actually also sense depth. You can infer depth. And you can have a combination of some more complicated modulation of the light source and some matching modulation, or not necessarily matching, some other modulation of the shutter. You can take several images with different pulses of light that you send into the scene, different uh, shutter sequences. And in this way, you do compressed sensing of uh, of so, for example, if you are sending a pulse of light, so you sent it, let's say, at time zero, and it reflected from an object in your pixel, you will have a delta function returning after twice, let's call it twice t, it, the distance uh, up to this to normalization by the speed of light. But then, if you have multipath reflection, you might have some tails here light will come from different directions. And if you want to reconstruct this multipath reflection, so basically this is the function that you would like to sense. And it is sparse, it has a lot of structure. So you can do compressed sensing to sense these, uh, these uh, functions. This is called compressed time of flight imaging. And you can actually get very good reflectivity images and very good depth images from this. And this is actually, this is, uh, this is a technology that was described by by the former uh, Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft had two depth imaging groups, uh, one of them coming from a company called Caneste, another one coming from a company called 3D Vision, 3DV Systems. And uh, this is the 3DV system uh, uh, technology that is currently used in HoloLens. So they are not using all the crazy capabilities of this sensor, but you can actually do multipath imaging uh, using uh, compressed time of flight. Okay, any questions? Another thing that I would like to mention to you, so, so far we talked about essentially linear sensors, right? So a pixel typically responds linearly to the amount of light that it collects. Of course, if the amount of light is very low or it saturates the pixel, basically it cannot collect more photons than, uh, th than it, it has already collected, then, of course, there will be some nonlinear response. Now, if you look at the surrounding world, you will see that the dynamic range of our images can be one to one million or even more. So a dark object and another object nearby illuminated by direct sunlight have this kind of discrepancy in the, in the reflectivity. And, of course, you cannot, with a single exposure, you cannot uh, have this dynamic range. So typically, typically a pixel can collect thousands or maybe tens of thousands of photons, uh, and then it will saturate. If you, uh, if you want a bigger dynamic range, you need to take several exposures. This is what's done in high dynamic range imaging. But then if you have a moving object, then several exposures, of course, will be misaligned. So then it is very difficult to bring them back into, into a single image. Our eye wor works differently. Our eye uh, is a dense, relatively dense array of uh, photoreceptor. Each photoreceptor, count it's like a Geiger counter. It counts single photons. We can actually respond, maybe not our eye in particular, maybe not to a single photon, but to as low uh, as five photons. And some other animals can actually respond to a single photon. So today we, we know how to manufacture uh, photodiodes that can respond to a single photon. So you will, it will produce a burst of current, and then it will go into some refractory period in which it collects nothing, and then it will again be sensitive to photons. So if you can create a very, very dense array of these kind of binary pixels, it, it will resemble, so if you, if you, close if you close up uh, 
uh, this image, you have basically a very dense array of binary pixels. Of course, the pitch between the pixels is way, way denser than the diffraction limit of your lens. So essentially, they are going to measure the same, the same light. But they're going to collect photons. You're going to read them out very, very fast. You're just reading out one bit, but from a denser array and with much higher temporal resolution. You can compare this to, uh, to a photographic film. In a photographic film, you have, uh, you have small grains of typically silver halide, silver bromide, or, or uh, typically or silver iodide, that uh, respond to light. And then this, uh, this silver halide, when it is hit by a photon, it becomes uh, metal silver. And then through a chemical process, you fix it. And that's how you get an image. So photographers used to talk about fast films and slow films. So fast films had big grains, so they could collect more light. They would have much higher sensitivity, but that was traded off by, again, bigger grains, grainier images, meaning lower spatial resolution. So there is a trade-off between spatial resolution and light sensitivity and te temporal resolution. Here, you can digitally develop this film. You can, have, uh, you can adaptively decide in which parts of the image you would like high resolution, in which uh, parts you would like uh, uh, more light sensitivity. You can obtain, you can compress your response curve into something logarithmic, something that we have in our eyes. So you can have a huge dynamic range here. And this is the response that the sensor gives you. So the dynamic range here can be, let's say, from 1 to 10 to the power 5 or 10 to the power 6, something that you cannot obtain with regular uh, sensors. So this, is, uh, this idea was actually proposed by, uh, by the same Eric Fossum who, uh, who invented the uh, CMOS pixels. Uh, he called these tiny photon counters jots. And there is actually a company uh, called Rambus, a Taiwanese company that manufactures memory chips that implemented these kind of cameras. Actually, it is very natural for a memory company to do it, because if you just shave off the, the packaging of, of, a, of a DRAM chip and expose it to light, you have a very densely packed array of pixels. And the memory technology reads the pixels. The dynamic memory reads the pixels all the time to refresh it. So basically, you're, you have a very fast readout of single bit pixels. It's, it, that's why it is very natural for a memory company to, to do it. Of course, to do, a, to do a proper sensor, you need to, uh, to use more sophisticated technology. But, but this can be a very interesting uh, uh, sensor for uh, high dynamic range applications. So, so basically, it compresses the dynamic range into this nonlinear uh, response curve. And of course, there are many more interesting things that you can do in computational imaging. For example, you can do uh, light field imaging, basically taking uh, small uh, images from slightly different vantage points that allows you to reconstruct depth, allows you to reconstruct, uh, to basically to refocus an image that has already been taken. So if you're interested in computational imaging, there are great classes that both Anat Levine and Jov Schechner uh, teach uh, in the WE department. Uh, and Again, this is, a f this is a very rapidly developing uh, field of imaging and image processing that uh, is already changing the way we do imaging. Maybe not in the, in the mainstream imaging, but definitely in more exotic types of imaging. I will finish here. <laughs>